To the Moon is an incredible game whose story couldn't have been more pure and moving. The simplistic graphics and gameplay deceive players who have no idea that they're in for a narrative that's as close to perfect as I can imagine. But before I continue, I want to say that I realize this isn't one of the AAA titles that I'm used to doing a detailed analysis of, but To the Moon is one of the best experiences that you can have with a game. If you haven't yet played it, please do yourself the favor before watching this video. It's as inexpensive as any novel you could buy, and I cannot substitute the story. I only offer you a compliment to it. And considering Khan Gao's spiritual successor, A Burr Story, is coming out just around the corner on November 5th, I felt this was a good time to explain what this game meant to me. With that said, I should say that I've been reading my time management books, so while I first considered leaving four hours of dead air so you could buy and finish the game, it's probably a better idea if you pause the video and do that on your own time. Soul Porpoise will be here when you get back. For those of you who have had the pleasure of playing the game, I want to concede that I'm aware I cannot add too much to the emotional oasis that is John and River's story, but I can't pass up the opportunity to discuss its contents, because its message is too important to me. Thanks a ton for joining me today. This is Soul Porpoise, and today we're going to be doing a close reading of To the Moon. Since the game forces you to consider what it means from the very beginning, I want to begin by urging you to consider the role that the player has as a viewer and a player. We aren't actually given the perspective of the main character, John. Instead, we play through Neil and Eva. It allows you to view the game as a self-satire, and the fact that you play as two characters that are removed from the story, yet still comment and engage in it with you, it is something that can only be delivered through the video game medium. The reason I'm confident is I've seen the viewer put in similar situations in the show Mystery Science Theater 3000, which if you haven't seen is a show where the characters are forced to watch bad movies, but make fun of them the whole way through to maintain their sanity. A show like this is extremely interesting because it puts the viewer and the characters in a situation where they're sharing experience and then making fun of it. And more than this, it offers us a story within a story. The prologue and short skits where they provide a comedic excuse to explain why the characters are in the situation they're in, and that's followed by the viewer viewing the movies as just another audience member who enjoys the terrific timing and witty jokes of the critics. While I'm a fan of the show, I always realized that I couldn't care less about the actual movie that they were making fun of and criticizing. Through the video game medium, however, we don't just take a perspective of a voyeur interested in watching how the characters cope, as well as enjoying the ride while it lasts. Instead, we experience this as almost a third character who's experiencing for the first time the services that Neil and Eva are providing. Although the characters are entertaining and we enjoy their cynical commentary and even their story, we're also fascinated and more importantly vested in the story of John and River. The true genius in delivering the narrative in this way has everything to do with the game's most profound theme, the duality between romanticism and realism. Now, these are loaded terms that may have been destroyed for you, the word romanticism is commonly shorthand for anything that has to do with love, and realism has probably been destroyed through boring people prefacing boring statements with, well, I'm a realist, so something something there is no hope. So let me take a moment to define these terms in their literary sense. Romanticism is the movement that, although it's concerned with love, also wants to highlight how important the emotions are to the hero character or characters. They usually go on journeys and are capable of doing otherwise impossible things because of how awesome their emotions are. Impossible things like going to the moon to reunite with the love of their life. And since we are so engrossed with this part of the plot by rooting for John and River, I know that many of us got swept up in this idea. Conversely, realism came out of the Romantic movement. Understood to be its opposite, realism is concerned with accurately depicting the natural world. That is to say, the world that we can physically observe. It's focused on characters more than the plot, and values didactic instructions that help us analyze the real world. This movement, not surprisingly, was accompanied by many breakthroughs in science like evolutionary theory and the discovery of psychology. And since science is the study of the natural world, we find great admiration and reverence for the discipline in the realist movement. And this is why we find that instead of just skilled workers, Eva and Neil represent the realist movement since they are both doctors, a profession that's understood to make one a representative of science. And it should be also mentioned that they wear the exclusively scientific white lab coats. Even though their commentary is witty and enjoyable, they have a sense of routine that helps us to understand that they never get caught up in the romanticism of the moment. Even against the beautiful backdrop that is the ending that made us weep 
they remain desensitized to the beautiful story that unfolds before them. We see the duality of the two movements more than just through the narrative, though. We see it through the characters themselves. Not that the characters I'm about to mention are identical. We've seen characters embody these movements in Mark Twain's The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, where Huck represents the realist who couldn't afford to be anything different, and Tom Sawyer who represents the romantic who gets carried away with grand ideas that were far too ambitious for him to actually commit to. Similarly, we find that River also represents realism, and John represents romanticism. Where John finds River inexplicably unique, including everything from her mannerisms to her logic, he finds he's uncontrollably attracted to her. But as we already know, the reason she's different is the very scientific explanation that is Asperger syndrome, which is a form of autism. We see River's realism when she explains to John that she'll refuse medical treatment because she recognizes John's belief that they can afford it and the home next to the lighthouse as an overzealous white lie, and thereby not being an accurate representation of reality. Lastly, we see the duality between realism and romanticism directly by being the player who is painfully aware that the ending that John experiences just after you find out what the moon means to him only exists in his brain and never in the physical world. We are seemingly asked to ignore this fact as the ending plays out as beautifully as it does. Because after realizing this, there's a sense of emptiness in knowing that River never experiences meeting John on the moon. But I urge you not to get caught up on this fact because there's a sense of extraordinary beauty after taking into consideration what the Emperor's New Clothes, one of the books that's referenced several times in the game, has to do with the story. For those of you who aren't familiar with the story, The Emperor's New Clothes is about a foolish and vain emperor. Two tailors, who are actually swindlers, sell the emperor nothing and tell him it's an extremely fine suit made from a new material that appears invisible to the stupid and incompetent. So, knowing of this, and not wanting to appear like a town full of ninnies, everyone pretends that the Emperor is wearing a fine new suit as he parades down the streets naked. It isn't until a child yells, but he isn't wearing anything at all, that the Emperor suspects that he is actually naked. But the most important part of the story is that he continues the parade after hearing this, continuing to believe the fantasy instead of the reality. I certainly don't see To the Moon as an allegory for the story of the Emperor's new clothes, but the major theme cannot be ignored the theme of foregoing reality, with preference given to the unreality. And although John certainly resembles this role of the Emperor, being that he paid to have this story unfold in his dreams, we the player are also guilty of playing the role of the Emperor. During the masterfully presented climax that is the scene where you discover that the moon is a symbolic meeting place for John and River for when they're separated, we're also struck by how River compares the stars to John's name and calls them equally beautiful in their similarity. She goes on to say that she would one day like to befriend the stars, because as she views them, they're just another lighthouse on the backdrop of the distant sky. And she accomplishes her hopes in the real world as a custodian of the lighthouse where John built their home. And I find it especially beautiful that John gets to pursue the symbol that to him represents the much brighter and unique light in the sky that's distinct from all the others, and thereby represents River. Now, I wouldn't be original in revealing the secret that this story made me tear up, it did for many of us. But this contradicts the fact that, as audience members, we're aware that John going to the moon only happened in his brain, and never in reality. But I think we lament the idea of calling out, like the little girl from the Emperor's New Clothes did, that none of this is real. Like the Emperor, we prefer to experience and relate to the unreality that is John's story. Because as unreal as it is in the world that the rest of us experience, it's real to John in the exact same way that the story of the game as a whole is real to the player. And for this fact, To the Moon begs to be compared to what storytelling does for us, and why I find this to be such an important thing for humans to do with each other. Because even though we understand stories to be often exaggerated, one-sided, or even flat-out fictions, we experience the emotions, and the tears, and the smiles that come with it, or we can experience the practical understanding of the world, and the didactic instructions that come with it. And rarely, we're privileged to experience a story that offers both. The most important goal in storytelling isn't so that we're all connected more with each other for experiencing a streamlined story. It's that we're all connected with the storyteller. Whether those storytellers be two deceptive tailors, two cynical doctors, or just one brilliant game designer. Because even though we didn't physically experience this story, that doesn't make our experience any less real.